In this morning's lecture, I spent too much time dwelling on Danish uh, uh, hoys, partly because I'm a huge fan of them, because their engineering is so sophisticated, but also because in sites like Baranis, we're now discovering that we have equivalent monuments that use the same constructional methods uh, here in Scotland, and we have never, we didn't know that before. Um, <coughs> and the significance of that for me is that it points to a greater significance, a greater cultural significance, a greater sophistication in society, and certainly a much higher level of sophistication in construction than we normally allow for the Neolithic. We still have a kind of paradigmatic background feeling that they're squat grunting savages throwing one stone on another and hoping that they'll stick. Well, you know, it's a little bit more to it than that. But having spent too much time on that this morning, um, I didn't really develop my final point, which is this issue of the challenge of getting the passage into the forecourt and how you manage the crushing mass of the core cairn, which is built in a very dense fashion, how you manage the support of that when you've got to push a passage in under it. And that's where we'll start now. <coughs> well, the use, the use of uh, parallel-sided structures like these in the Orkney Cromarty group of cairns is well known particularly in the northeast of Scotland, and several of them, as you saw, as you heard yesterday, were excavated by Rind, the patron of this series, <coughs> or the original patron of this series. These can be very long, with chambers that contain up to 14 bays. Each bay now is subdivided by the vertical jamstones in opposed pairs with horizontal arched uh, walls between. In these monuments, it's noticeable that there is slight or really no curvature in the corbelling of the short walls at the end. They're virtually vertical curtain walls. <laughs> the unresolved lateral forces of the linear passages are counteracted by the revetment of the polycoped terracing on the outside, by which I mean that sort of terracing there, which you see <coughs> as excavated there. At the back, at the rear of the cairn, the revetment is provided by the mass of the long cairn behind. The facade terraces provide relatively massive masonry volumes that increase in height towards the front, uh, towards the chamber, going from the forecourt up to the chamber. And thus they buttress the ends of the linear sidewalls. The mass to be carried at the passage chamber junction, which is now really the entrance chamber junction, is greatly reduced because no part of the mass of the corbelling has to be supported by the passage. So we give the challenge a body swerve by using this long form of cairn, Orkney cairn. And a setting of lintels, now the lintel shown here is, is wrong in this illustration. There were a group of uh, slighter lintels, but set on edge. Instead of being set so, they were turned upright and stacked one behind the other to give more support. But all they carried really was this, you know, this curtain wall across the front. They did not have to support a massive corbelled uh, weight. Now I want to turn to um, an idea uh, first floated by Gould and Lewontin. This is Jay Gould, the environmental or the evolutionary theorist. He stole from architecture the idea of the spandrel for explaining exaptive developments. The example that's usually given for exaptation is that the, the boneless fish had spiny rods or had cartilaginous rods, rods that supported their gills. With evolution towards bony structures, these rods no longer had that function, and function wasn't required, um, and evolution modified them into uh, mandible, maxilla, hyoid, and I think collarbones, I think, over in, in a series of separate evolutionary steps subsequent to this. So 
exaptive developments are those which are not arrived at in the standard course of an evolution. It's evolution finding a way to reuse stuff left over from a previous modification that had no current function. Now, in a little bit of, um, of an inversion, I want to steal that idea from Gould back into architecture. In masonry structures, the spandrels are the triangular areas to the left and right of the arch when we push an arch through a rectangular panel. These are structurally functionless and they're simple consequences of the construction of the arches uh, beneath them. Over time, and given that nature and early medieval architects abhorred a vacuum, these became amongst the most highly decorated areas in churches. Spandrels thus exemplify John Ruskin's credo that architecture is all the bits of the building that you don't need. Certainly, the strong social and didactic role that spandrels took on uh, um, as artists' panels, really, uh, for storytelling, contrast very strongly with the lack of any specific structural function whatsoever. Now, I suggest that the forecourt facade developed as a structural necessity, buttressing and counteracting the unresolved forces of the long parallel-sided chamber, but they became integrated into the polycope walls on the exterior at the cairn faces. And thus its primary function may have been the provision of structural stability, but its form becomes a piece of architecture. In short, it becomes a spandrel. <laughs> Not that kind of spandrel, but the conceptual spandrel of something evolving for one purpose and being adapted to another. While some of the horned cairns, and you saw uh, the, the pointed cot horned cairn earlier, some of these were built in that form from the beginning. In many instances, however, an existing chamber and possibly even a horned chamber with its own forecourt becomes subsumed into that much longer uh, long cairn type. The long cairns in the strict sense, have a pronounced forecourt. The meaning of the forecourt and facade arrangements have been discussed, but surprisingly, not to any great extent, nor to any consensual conclusion. Perhaps because the forecourt consistently fails to deliver the evidence for ritual richness, which it is imagined should be there, because we imagine that its role is to be an amphitheatre for the practice of behaviors associated with burial. We might be wrong. Nevertheless, it is in fact a clear expression of a Neolithic aesthetic. Its symmetry in the horizontal plane, its strong lines on polycopy, its de deeply indented polygonal curves, and the integration of its side terraces with the long sides of the long cairn, and the convergence of the latter by 10 degrees towards the central axis of symmetry, long axis of symmetry, all these point to a design concept arising not from structural necessity, but from cultural choice. And to some extent, I feel, therefore, that the long cairn in its developed form marks a transition from, the, from building to architecture, from engineering to architecture, with the transition um, from blocking masonry spandle uh, at the front end to the architectural trope of the forecourt area. In adopting the spandrel analogy here, now let me say, I'm not arguing for a Darwinian evolution of monument forms, rather I'm arguing for the development of the knowledge base of the builders over time, but of course conditioned by the resources available to them. Neolithic recognition of this transition is to an extent supported in the remodeling of existing monuments to comply with this new form. <coughs> Excuse me, long cairns and especially the long horned cairns were built to envelop existing monuments and to bring them into an emergent orthodoxy. And we can see that, for example, at um, Camster Long and Tullochet Chernich cairns, uh, both in the northeast. <coughs> 
This is all architecture, the imposition onto the brutish reality of a conception that has nothing much to do with the way in which the brutish reality was built. And in fact, some of the cairns thus encompassed were already decomposing before they were stuck into the long cairn. You can see uh, in the right-hand image here, you're looking down the side of Campster Long, and you can see that the second monument, which was, there are two chambers in this long cairn, the second one had already decomposed so far that it was uneconomical to bring the hornwork out past it. So the wall actually breaks. The wall goes as far as that mound of rubble and then breaks off and continues from the other side. So there is no doubt, and there's no doubt in some, in certainly Tulloch at Chanak as well, which is excavated by Cochrane, who is a superb field worker, no doubt at all that the monuments are enveloped and that when they were enveloped, they were already significantly deteriorated. Is this perhaps then our earliest British example of an architectural idea triumphing over the physical realities of the structure? A first indication of the triumph of a caste, a technical uh, craft group, or perhaps even a priesthood over the realities of ordinary existence. Perhaps it's the triumph of social mechanics over the rude mechanicals. I think there's a transition there, an important one, from you know, construction, albeit in sophisticated ways, to the creation of an architecture. Right, I want to look now at entrance passages. The entrance passage only just appears there. You can see that there's a step down, step down, step down, and a final step down, probably not shown there. The outer ends of these passages, if they were roofed with lintels, and it seems as if they were, would have given access to a very small dog, but certainly not to a human being, unless it had recently been run over by a, a steamroller. It's easy to be deceived by the accessibility of traditional passage grave entrances, like this one at Mays Howe. Do I mean Mays Howe? I do mean Mays Howe. <coughs> but many Orkney Cromarty Cairns have very restricted entrance passages. And this is far more typical. This is at the Howe, I think, and that's Widderford Hill. Or Wideford Hill, and I never know how they pronounce it. Anyway, for God love them, they can pronounce it any way they like. Um, this rather suggests to me that the outer two-thirds of the passage is non-functional. It was never intended to be used as a passage because he couldn't use it as a passage. It might simply owe its existence to the persistence of some principle of bilateral symmetry, which as noted earlier, or should have been noted earlier, seems an almost universal observation in Neolithic architecture. Everything is bilaterally symmetrical, virtually indicating perhaps that the concepts of a developing aesthetic outlined above were also at work here. Viewed as a skewomorph, and for those who don't know what skewomorphs are, they're the retention of earlier forms and earlier ideas in later expressions. And in this case, this is a, a brougham uh, carriage. The earliest railway carriages, as you can see, closely mimic that. And then when the carriages begin to reduce to something, a form that we'd be more familiar with, they nonetheless painted the shape onto the outside. Uh, these these um, relics of old decency are skewomorphs. Well, perhaps the passages are skewomorphic, indicating that the oh, la, 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 indicating that the developing aesthetic which we've just spoken about is still at work here. Viewed as a skewomorph, it changes the accepted view that long cairns, especially long trapezoidal cairns, were a new introduction from Europe, perhaps from Polish or Central European prototypes. Because why would you introduce a new form with non-functional elements? That doesn't ring true to me. There's an arguable case for seeing the emergence of the long chamber as a rational development from the management in fact, from the rational avoidance of having to manage the mass of the passage chamber junction uh, in the area of the uh, passage and chamber intersection. And onto this, perhaps, the idea of the long trapezoidal cairn was grafted. Henschel has shown that the lack of correlation between the forms of chambers and the forms of cairns <coughs> 
And this should be symptomatic of the non-functional nature of the bulk of the cairn outside the core cairn. You can't build a chamber without a core cairn, but once you've done that, you can make the external cairn, the cairn envelope, in any form you like. Freed of the constraining need to fulfil some structural purposes, the builders were at liberty to create uh, a range of forms, which they do, ranging from circular to square to trapezoidal, you name it. With smaller chambers, the facade abutments in front of the chamber would be lower and shorter, further reducing the passage length. Passage length. This knowledge-based development, experiential development, would have happened over time, or perhaps simply have been an inspired development that was contemporary, even with the longer passage to monuments, or perhaps they flip-flop. Um, I'm trying to suggest to you here. Well, you'll see what I'm suggesting shortly. At Burrell and East, which I spoke about earlier, the, um, the passage outside of the antechamber is a little more than two meters long. And in that length, as you can see here, these are the two, they're tilted forward towards us, but they're the two portal stones of the antechamber with the main burial chamber beyond it. And this is the passage. And you can see even small dogs would be challenged. Borrelin is a D-shaped cairn, and this type, together with the square cairns, are generally possessed of very short passages outside of the chamber, or in some cases, antechamber, to which the access was required. Of the 21 square or D-shaped cairns in Shetland, 66% are of the certain or probable examples noted by Ms. Henshaw in 1963, have passages that don't pierce the facade at all. This, we may suppose, is the ultimate shortening of the passage, which is its abandonment. The fairly standard form of the passage grave is present in Shetland monuments, even in, again, I may not have the pronunciations right, Venantry. There's a standard passage grave in there, look, and it looks to me as if this is slapped on the outside of it and no provision is made here for the entrance. But there are 13 other chambered cairns in which there's no evidence whatsoever of access from the facade uh, into the chamber. Progressively, the chamber structure is reduced to the shape of an upturned boat, keel-shaped with a flat front, and the entrance is through the transom. And again, it has a great advantage. That entrance wall is a curtain wall. It doesn't need to be massive, and access through it is much more easily engineered. Um, the wedge-shaped gallery graves of Ireland, which are much later, probably at the late Neolithic early Bronze Age transition, are much simpler structures. They're very often made from stone, which has very clearly been cut to shape. They're wedge-shaped in plan and in section, and they have that same uh, boat-shaped chamber with a flat curtain wall across the front here. Unless we're seized with Orkney's zeal to be the center of the universe, we should probably agree that the Irish wedges were probably not derived from the Shetlandish cairns, which are probably 1,500 years earlier. It's proven to acknowledge again that there's little evidence to suggest that this is a Darwinian evolution. The stages observed here could be contemporaneous, or nearly so, even if a design principle was developing that optimised the scale and perhaps proportions of the chamber while reducing the enveloping mass to something that's closer to um, affordability by perhaps smaller uh, uh, community groups. It's tempting to see the passage foreshortening as a series of stages that could be ordered, albeit in a poorly defined chronology or chronotypology, to indicate the directing, that directed access from the outside to the chamber resulted from an evolutionary process in the North, main, in the North Mainland. But this largely bypasses Orkney. We have Neolithic tombs, early Neolithic tombs, of this proportion, you know, boat-shaped things with curtain walls. We have them in the northwest of Scotland, 
and we have them in Shetland. And I note that there are no short cairns with truncated or absent passages, whether D-shaped, heel-shaped, or square, that were built from sedimentary slabs. They're all made of hard rock uh, lith uh, lithological types. Conversely, on Orkney and Caithness, where we don't really have a shortage of cairns, there are no cairns of this type. Um, we don't, uh, yes, we don't, we don't have in Orkney, or we don't have in, certainly we don't have in Orkney, I argue, and we don't have in Caithness anything that looks quite like Isleboro or Crooksetter. The occurrence in Sutherland of D-shaped cairns like Barrowland with a truncated skeuomorphic but complete pa passage, uh, i.e. one that pierces the facade, is restricted to an area of metamorphic and volcanic bed bedrock types and is made possible by the development or ad adoption of the, of the techniques which we have seen were perfected or brought to a high stage of perfection in Denmark. <coughs> it's possible, therefore, to, therefore, to argue, and I do, that the diversity of forms of the Orkney Cromarty group of cairns owes a great deal to the physical limitations of the available construction material. There's a much more detailed argument that underpins that, but life is too short. Take my word for it. Now, the regional categorizations, categorizations I beg your pardon, proposed by Audrey Henshaw, together with Jimmy Davidson and, and uh, uh, and Ritchie in 1985 and 2001, drew from the categorizing work of their predecessors and contemporaries, including Child, Pickett, Daniel, Scott, Corcoran, and many others. And they have gained not so much a general acceptance as a general consensus. And they have that status uh, in, in the profession. These groups are conceived of in archaeology as the products of architectural schools but attempts to interrelate them have been so uniformly dismal in their failure that there's no current credible uh, phylogeny. I don't see anybody arguing that that type evolved from that type and that and that got together and bred those. That argument isn't on the table because they, it just won't work. I've already commented on Gordon Backley's appeal for regional archaeologies and the abandonment of national archaeologies because these were the national archaeologies that would not work. But also his suggestion that um, it was important not to forget the background framework of similarity, which allows us to look at chambered cairns everywhere and say chambered cairn. His reactions, excuse me, his reactions to the difficulty of reconciling issues of heterogeneity on one scale and apparent homogeneity on another mirrors this same problem in the study of chambered cairns. The issues of so-called scale variance, the tendency of populations of objects to present values and configurations that alter with scale, which we shall see uh, again later, is also a factor here. Earlier, I offered you the proposition that architectural schools like the Romanesque have profiles, uh, existential profiles, akin to Neolithic chambered cairns. We have great individual variation, substantial regional variance, and much wider general uh, similarities. But I'm convinced now, um, and I'm not entirely certain that I can defend it, but I am convinced that it's a strong vernacularity of building and of building tradition uh, that finds equally strong regional expression in the forms produced in chambered cairns. I don't believe that this is like a formal architectural school. I believe that it's a network of vernacular um, adjustments to the challenge of creating an accessible chamber using loose stone, using dry stone. The incomplete, overlapping, regionalized, and diverse near taxonomy of chambered cairns has more in common with vernacular architecture than with established architectural movements. The patterning we can see in the Scottish chambered cairns is more consistent with vernacular architecture than with the traditions of grand uh, architectural narratives. 
but it mustn't bl blind us to the underlying design intent, chamber and passage, uh, intended to create spaces suited to their purposes and the intended design, including uh, a significant chamber accessed by a passage or port. That desire having been expressed, the available building material would precondition a great deal of the resulting form. I want to speak a little bit about vernacular or polite buildings now. Social context provides the initial stimulus for building, for building a specific form, whatever the intended function. In dealing with Brox in the next lecture, I will argue, for example, that the 2012 zeitgeist, zeitgeistic view of the Brock uh, uh, was really crystallized in Alan Braby's uh, illustration of a farming community uh, living inside a deeply unsatisfactory Brock. Within this context, it is paradoxically assumed that the Brock was a vernacular build, and that's a common assumption still, that Brocks are vernacular, vernacular builds, probably on a par with Amish barn raising, which is the simile I'm constantly, I constantly hear, um, mostly from people who've never been to an Amish barn raising, because it's not vernacular architecture, I can tell you that for a start. Anyhow, the idea is that Brocks are built by several families combining to complete con the construction. It's perhaps one of life's ironies that finding the chambered uh, cairns considered to be polite architecture, I now argue that they're vernacular, and finding the brocks which we have assumed are vernacular, I will lately, I will shortly, I beg your pardon, be arguing that they're polite architecture, not vernacular. I'm not a contrarian, really. <laughs> Having said that, the next sentence begins, Contra Brunskill. Brunskill is a very good vernacular architect, or vernacular historian, a historian of vernacular architecture, that's what he is. Uh, anyway, contra him, I do believe that the active engagement of non-professional local designers and builders, and of the local community, and in general restricted to local materials, immediately locally available materials, are generally the preconditions to a vernacular tra tradition. And in this I find myself in agreement with Ian Tate's approach. Ian Tate is an outstanding uh, scholar on this, on this subject. And if you haven't read his book on the vernacular architecture of Shetland, you should. It's a fantastic read. However, I want to go on to say that vernacular does not imply unchanging. And here Asquith Vellinger and others suggest that it constitutes a dynamic equilibrium rather than a static tradition. I've put that up for its wordiness. I, 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 can't, I agree with what he says, but I can't imagine, you know, um, Neolithic builders of, from Glasgow leaning against the side of a cairn and saying to each other, or Edinburgh for that matter, saying, Jesus, how do you feel now about precedent and creativity on this cairn? I kind of imagine those conversations are um, Nemosak conversations. They're not conversations of the monument. Tate, who may not share this view, I think, nonetheless identifies evolutionary sequences, for example, in the typology of 12 types of farmstead within the vernacular inheritance of Shetland. And this reminds me that Esten Evans, who was an ethnographer in Belfast University and heavily engaged in, ar in archaeology during his time there, in his ethnography of the Irish countryside, says in terms that at the beginning of the 20th century, an observer informed of the vernacular styles of housing, especially patterns of thatch, and the forms of farm tools and such like, would have been able to identify with certainty which barony they were in and probably which parish they were in, based only on those parameters. So vernacularity is highly particularist, highly regionalized. Vernacular architecture in the sense of folk architecture is, char is characterized therefore by local and regional variations in addition to its variations over time. And that's the model I have in mind for Neolithic chambered cairns. Mm -hmm. 
If, however, the only tool we have is a hammer, then every problem we'll face will look like a nail. I have no doubt that typologies, chronologies and geographies of engineering solutions of which we speak here can be created and might even be interesting. Jesus, I like a good fairy story. That said, there is currently insufficient recorded observations of the relevant features of the monument, which is insufficient observation of their structural parameters, to allow us to do that with confidence. Neither is it obvious to me, which you'll have gathered by now, that Darwinian evolutionary models that underpin such studies are in any way applicable to these structures. Now, I want to talk about the paradigm of the Neolithic. Up to very recently, we thought about the Neolithic as being um, an archaeology peopled with elven folk who lived in the woodland, who were cheery and happy, who were utterly egalitarian, all equally liable to be buried in a chambered cave. And of course, it's utter tosh. Nonetheless, it's still quite shocking that, say, in Germany, not, not more than a decade ago, the Talheim death pits were discovered in which I think 15 or 18 peak dead bodies were found with arrowheads stuck in their backs because they were running away when they were killed. Always the best way to kill somebody, by the way. Um, and then their heads had been smashed in with the characteristic shoe last axe of the area. And people were staggered that there was warfare in the Neolithic. Um, <laughs> I suppose, on the one hand, we shouldn't be surprised that we find that in Germany, but on the other hand, there was already plenty of evidence of it here in the United Kingdom. We didn't have to go that far afield to find it. So I don't see the Neolithic as peopled by elven folks, but by ordinary folks, just like you and me. Now, we noted earlier the use of up to, say, 300 tonnes of burnt flint in the Danish megaliths. The industrial scale of flint mining is well known, and the outputs of some flint mining areas is truly astonishing. About 150 million axe heads, now that's axe heads worth of flint, not necessarily finished axe heads, were extracted from Reichhold in the Netherlands. And even at Grimes Grave, which is a far more modest arrangement, about 10.5 million axe heads worth of flint was extracted uh, in, that, in that area. There are about 20 other known flint mines across the northern European plain there. And given the extraordinary yield from even one of these mines, we need not be surprised at one level by Whittle's suggestion that the scale of working seems disproportionate to the needs of everyday existence. However, the scale of working is real. We've excavated the thing. We saw that they've extracted, we see that they've extracted that much material. So the surprise should not be, um, <coughs> the dis sorry, uh, the disproportion lies not in the scale of extraction, but in the scale of our expectation. We still have that elven forest view of the Neolithic, and we can't imagine that you can have industrial scale mining of a commodity like flint with distribution all over Europe. Um, Allison's work on the jadeite axes uh, from the Alps, which again end up all over Europe, is an index, I guess, of the existence of wholesale and retail trade on a generous scale across the European landmass. I realize that we can rationalize it by suggesting that each axe was passed person to person to person to person and that nobody actually moved. Who cares? Nonetheless, there was a trackway of trade that existed for the distribution of the material and the material wouldn't have been mined, wouldn't have been prepared at great expense unless that trackway existed and unless that trade was possible. So the idea of elves or squat grunting savages are disproportionate, I think, to the needs, to, to what we need to think uh, when we're looking at the context in which people are erecting these chambered cairns. Right. I'm going to talk briefly. You'll be delighted when I say the word briefly. We're not going to look at that. Bear with me for a second. I may have to talk to myself here for a moment. Yes. <clears throat> 
Chambered Cairns, in the ownership of the state, are the responsibility of the properties and care team at HES, who do a robust, and in my opinion, a professional job in the presentation of monuments excavated on average a century or more ago. More recently, there have been few large-scale excavations taking t uh, in, in, certainly in the north of Scotland. Cor certainly, and, and also certainly after Cochrane's work in the 60s and 70s, really only Renfrew at, Qu at Quantrenes, and that was a fairly modest excavation, Masters at Camsterlow, which is a property in care and was conducted on a generous scale. And then I've excavated at the Point of Cart, Warehouse East, Warehouse South, Loch Borrelin, all of them on complete, at least complete chamber scale. <clears throat> and a great deal, apart from that, a great deal of small to medium scale salami slicing of large monuments has gone on. Warehouse South is an excavation I undertook on behalf of the local Yarrow's Heritage Trust. And this is Warehouse South. And I have to start with a confession that it was thought to be a long cairn, which I didn't believe, even after the contour surveys indicated that it probably is a long cairn. Um, and part of the reason I didn't believe it, because by not believing it, I could irritate Patrick Ashmore, who, God knows, often enough irritated me. Um, but of course, on excavating at the back end of the, of the Long Cairn, we found the horn work at the back. And at the front end, there was a mass of stuff under where the blue arrow is there, just roughly, which I had dismissed as debris from it, Rind and Anderson's excavations. And which, when I excavated, I found is the front horn work sticking out the front. So I fear I had to, I had to revise my hypothesis a little bit. The laser scan images of the chamber and part of the passage, which you can see here. Although I work with these not every day, but certainly very often, I still find them hard to see. So you have my sympathy if you have to struggle to make sense of them. But I guess my overall attitude is man up and look. Um, I will show you, well, let's see. This is the entrance from the passage into the chamber. You're standing in the chamber looking towards the passage and there are two stone uh, lintels across there. I've enlarged them there. Here's one of them, which is behind. It looks as if it's in front of the stones. It's not, it's behind them. The laser scan data allows us to x-ray the, the, the structure. And the upper one uh, has fallen off of its, it was on top of eek stones, small stones on top of the orthostat, uh, the, the, the portal. And they, they've gone adrift. Um, now, You've seen those two lintels. Note that the upper lintel, which was resting on eek stones, as I've suggested, has been displaced and pushed back on the left-hand side. Now, here's what they look like to normal human beings. Um, there's that double lintel arrangement, the upper one clearly fallen back. Above it, you can see this area of corbelling, which is pitched very steeply back and has clearly fallen back. This is a consequence of Rind and Anderson's excavations because they emptied the, uh, the original construction over the passage. And then I think they actually built that. I think they removed it and they built it back in again. It's not very, it was not very well founded. It's, to my mind, clearly not a Neolithic piece of building. Um, and it eventually fell back. You'll see why in a moment. Spoke earlier about the difficulties that occur if you take a tholos, where all of the stuff is, all of the forces are cancelling each other out, and you cut a slice through it for a passage to go through. The tholos eases its way into the passage, and when that happens, you can see here that the corbels have gone horizontal; they've fallen down; they're no longer propped against each other, and they've actually drifted apart. The whole tholos has moved, has has relaxed. Uh, into the void which was left by the Victorian excavation. You can probably see over there, at least I hope you can, um, that the corbel stones forming the back wall of the chamber have similarly gone horizontal. 
it will not take very long for them to finally tip downwards and to fall in. Sadly, this tholos was complete when, wrong, when rind cut into the top of it. So all of this damage is created by archaeologists or antiquarians. Right. Cutting into, I emptied the, the Victorian trench. And the first thing I came upon was these, um, an attempt, I think, at reducing the load on the lintels in the passage by putting in a big jumble of voided stones. So they pile stones against each other to contain big air spaces to reduce the mass sitting on the lintels. We continued on, well, yes, there's the front lintel and there's a broken fragment of the second one there. But we continued in our demolition and removed more Victorian dross and found uh, gaps in the, in the lintel table. But we also found here, and there was here as well, but now removed, um, double lintels, where the first lintel goes across, if these are the side walls, the first lintel goes across here, and then you put some stones on this, and you put a second lintel up here, it's the weight of which is not resting on the lintel underneath. And the idea is that even if the top one breaks, uh, there's a damn good chance that the the lower one will survive the experience. I think that the Victorians had identified that, but they certainly didn't record it because they didn't remove it uh, here. At this end, here you see the back of Victorian recorbeling. And in here you can see a large flat slab, which is visibly broken into three pieces. In fact, it's visibly broken into about 3,000 pieces because when you lift that out and the, that end of that slab, they're so highly fractured that they just fell apart. It was <laughs> surface tension of the water that was holding those stones together. Uh, not, they had no structural integrity. Right. That's maybe a clearer view of that uh, Victorian cobbling and the lintel space in there. I should mention in passing that although we, we do have evidence, uh, recorded evidence from the laser scan surveys, that this passage, entrance passage, was built inside a larger keyhole shaped hole within which the chamber and the passage were constructed, presumably while the peasantry uh, built the rest of the cairn. So you had more skilled uh, construction going on in that keyhole. And you can reach your arm in through gaps in the side wall of the passage and feel that void in there. Um, I had wanted to get into it, but again, time and Shedra Monument consent did not permit. Um, Here you see these, uh, is this, there's, there's the upper uh, stone now being lifted back into position. There's the lower stone that are set across the entrance to the chamber. And there's a large part of the remains of that middle stone, uh, which actually existed as a shell. The bottom part of it had been smashed out. Um, extraordinarily, I guess, we were asked to replace that stone. There isn't enough superglue in England, Scotland, and Wales to replace that stone, so we didn't. Now, the passage is very hard to photograph because of the narrowness of, of the passage itself. But I think you can see here that it's in pretty chronic state. And it was in that state when these prehistoric lintels were put on top of it. It's a bit more obvious. Ooh, is it a bit more obvious? I ask myself. No, it's not. Sorry about the, cl the quality of this image. I will improve it. Um, not now, though. Um, the, the, I, I invite you to trust me that the side walls of the passage were in already a jumbled mass, but a mass that was sort of interlocked because of the way in which it was jumbled at the time when the lintels went off. We decided not to repair the side walls of the chamber 
of the passage, I beg your pardon, we decided not to repair the side walls of the passage because they're part of the biography of the monument. I think that these lintels were replaced by the people who put this chamber and passage into the longer cairn. The longer cairn was built around them and the thing was brought up to some sort of spec, regardless of how awful that spec may have been. And therefore I think it's a legitimate part of the history of the monument. We did have to replace some lintels, uh, and we replaced them in every case with uh, stones which were cut to shape. They're machine cut, and there shouldn't be any ambiguity about what we did. I mean, as well as that, of course, we have a very full record of what we did. Um, we had to use a fair old bit of stainless steel um, to support not only the existing weak or broken lintels, but even to form supports for some of the substitute lintels that we were putting in because the spans are too big. That front entrance stone you saw at the very start we were able to put back in again, it's extremely fragile. That part there is held together by spit and bird droppings um, and it will fail, no two ways about it. Um, but it's got two big stainless steel bars under it so it's not gonna fail anytime really soon. So long as I'm dead when it happens, I don't care. In filling up the space over the lintels farther into the cairn, we put bridging works. So that the, that bit of string there, look, is marking out the side wall of the passage on that side, and there was a corresponding piece of string there uh, marking the side wall on this side. So we put those slabs on masonry laid directly onto the side walls and then we bridged over them with these slabs. They're just parked there for now. Shortly after that, one of them was parked on my foot and uh, it was an extremely painful experience, as you might expect. Forbear. Right. What I've tried to do in running quickly through what was a long and a painful and a very difficult and challenging conservation process is to suggest to you that the idea of the conservation of things, which really means the preservation in their current state of things, is an old view of conservation. And really it was surpassed when ICOMOS began with the first edition of the Borough Charter to argue that we should be conserving the cultural value of the monument. And cultural value subsists in the ability of the, of the monument to inform this and future generations. So cultural value is information content. So meretriciously to alter the, cultural, the structural elements of the building for the purpose of having a stronger building at the expense of masking part of its information content is a loss of cultural value. We've tried, therefore, to conserve the cultural value here, even if that has meant that we haven't produced as robust a final object as we could have done. Once we finished that, we sealed off the passage and chamber again, having put in lots of telltales and having laser scanned, done a very detailed laser scanning of the interior, and in a couple of months' time, I'm going to go up and open it up again. We'll rescan it, and we'll see how much it's moved. My threshold <laughs> is, is 12 millimeters. If any part of it has moved more than 12 meter, millimeters, I'm going to close it again, and, uh, and it's going to stay closed. Well, as far as I'm concerned, anyhow. Other adventurers can enjoy themselves as they will. That brings me to the end of what I want to say about chambered cairns. I find them utterly fascinating, interesting and challenging, um, but uh, I think that we need to, going forward, we need to take the principle that as archaeologists, we're responsible for the crap we leave behind us. And if we don't start an excavation with a decent conservation plan, we shouldn't be allowed to excavate. That would be my closing comment on this. In the next lecture, we'll talk about Brooks. Thank you.